Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb. Over there is Tassos. I'm over here, over here. <laughs> and today's episode, we're super excited to be having Ken Rupel from Aviant here today. So it's going to be a real fun conversation. We're going to be talking about license links, Aviat, um, experiences, fun things, goofy things, so on and so forth. So I'm kind of really excited to see where this goes. But before we launch into that real quick, Tassos, give the good people out there their call to action. Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, or subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcasts like Apple, Google, or Spotify. All right, y'all. Well, let's make like a frog and hop to it. So, Ken, my man, so good to have you yeah. here. Glad you could, glad you could make it to our humble little podcast. And uh, real excited to talk to you today and get some history, learn a bit about you, learn a bit about Aviat, uh, and then uh, license links or whatever you guys got popping, whatever's interesting, we are game for. So, again, thanks for being here, man. Good deal. No, it's totally my pleasure. I appreciate the invitation. Thanks, guys. So for those out there that don't know you, Kim, uh, if you could kind of give us a history about, you know, your background in the industry, you've been doing this a long time, uh, but if you give us some background, can let us know how you came up with Aviat, what you do there, um, and we can just kind of roll from there. Well, yeah, um, I think you just called me old, but I, I do that for myself too, so that's okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're we're included in that club too, so don't feel bad. So. I think I branded myself one of those, you know, official old guy, so that's all right. You know, at, at this point in my, you're an OG. Yeah, there you go, OG. I like it. Um, yeah, the the history is interesting. I've been doing a little thinking about this. It's like, how did this all happen? Um, it's a weird little story, but it's kind of fun. So I'll go ahead and turn back the clock. Um, I was in, so it kind of starts off as a couple of different tracks. When I was a kid, I was really good at math. So like that was something I was into and because I was good at it. So, and, um, and I was also a musician. Um, and so like, I, I like playing music. I got into bands like in junior high and high school. And um, one of my bandmates, he was into music and electronics and he, and I couldn't afford all the stuff that I wanted to buy at the music store. But he taught me how to how to build stuff. Um, so he had these uh, circuit diagrams and things, and he was building amplifiers and all these kind of different gadgets for the music stuff. And I got into that saying, I, well, I need a mixer and I need an amplifier and I need a fuzz box and all these kinds of things. So he taught me how to do some basic electronics. And um, following sort of that um, angle, because there's a separate angle that sort of tees into this, I ended up working um, for a junior high, junior in high school. I think I left my job at Baskin Robbins and got my first official job in the electronics industry and started doing PC board assembly and QA for this little company in my town. And uh, I grew up in Silicon Valley, by the way. So it was kind of like easy to get electronics job. It was kind of like all there was here. Um, <laughs> but from, from there, um, I, so one day, this is how it kind of ties together. One day I'm, um, going into a summertime right before my freshman year in college and my company that I've been working for for two years says, you know, this summer, we're not really going to be able to keep you on full time with all the extra hours that you normally like to, to do in the summer because I like to build up all my cash in the summer and spend it on school. And um, they said, so, you know, if you can find some, some of the gig, um, that'd be great for you. Great for us. Uh, hey, you know, if you can't find anything, we'll, we'll take you on whatever hours we can. So I'm literally sitting in the kitchen table with my drummer and his dad, because my, my, my drummer's dad's house is where we used to, we used to practice. And so we spent a lot of time there and made a lot of noise. And, and I'm telling him, yeah, man, I'm kind of bummed. You know, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to make much money this summer. I got to find some new job. Well, his dad overhears me and he says, Hey, you know, my, my company has a summer internship program. And um, my friend who the drummer was working at his dad's company full time at that point in time. I had no idea what they did. I said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm game. You know, he said, well, you're kind of into electronics and you're going into engineering school and all that. That sounds perfect. You know, let me see if I can get you an interview. I, I don't think I'd interviewed for anything. So anyway, ultimately I get this job at a company called Harris Farinon and Harris Farinon <laughs> is obvious. <clears throat> that's the that's the irony of the whole thing is um, <laughs> my first microwave job was my freshman year at college or the summer before my freshman year in college over 40 years ago. So you can do the math and figure out how old I am. Um, and um, 
And that was building their very first digital microwave radios. Oh, wow. 15 feet tall. I built six gigahertz, one six gigahertz radio and one 11 gigahertz radio. It took me all summer to build two radios from the ground, from the ground to the top of the, the stack. Um, and my job was basically to build the very first ones in a pseudo production line and write up ECOs for how it could be done better. Like if this screw goes in first before that screw, or this screw should be longer, or this wire should be over there, not over here, address this way, whatever, you know, whatever it would take to make it easier to build these things. I'd never built one before the engineers had put one together and that was it. So these were the very first digital microwave radios ever built as far as I know. Maybe some other company had ever had done it, but but that was uh, what Aviat was, or what Harris Farinon was doing at the time. So I spent a summer there. They actually offered me an ongoing internship program, but it would have been really distracted to my engineering degree um, that I wanted to go after. And so that kind of launched me into, I had no idea what these things even did, frankly. They're just pieces <laughs> of in the sky. Lots of waveguide, weird parts, all sorts of weird things that you've never seen yeah. before. Uh, <laughs> so then I get into college and I'm and I want to be an engineer, but I have really no idea what an engineer does. <laughs> Frankly, it's like uh, that's what math nerds do. You know, they go into engineering. That's what everybody does in Silicon Valley, you go into engineering. So that's what I did. And um, ultimately, I ended up having a, a college professor who was an industry guy who got me in very interested in microwaves. He was just like, I don't know whether that was his passion, but he taught a microwaves course. I got into it. I really, really liked it. The company I would, had been working for that one that had that one summer break was actually like a fiber optics uh, uh, company. That's an odd thing to say. They don't, weren't really doing fiber optics, but they were using fiber optics in their technology. So I had, I had touched fiber optics and light sensors and things like that. So I knew kind of a little bit about that. And I got really passionate about microwaves. And it's kind of weird to say, you know, most people don't get a degree in microwave, but I effectively got a degree in microwave. Um, cool. So that, you know, that kind of got me started. I got through college. Um, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, made exactly. It. It's like my parents are like, you better do this in four years, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people graduate college in eight years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're called well, doctors, right? <laughs> <laughs> or philosophers, yeah. Yeah, something like no, that. No offense to anybody philosophers out there. But, um, uh, the, yeah, some, some are still in school, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, um, you know, from there, it was weird. I ended up um, working for a company right out of college. I went working for a military um, company, basically. Um, and they were doing um, reconnaissance equipment for the military. This was like still before the Cold War, if anybody remembers that, you know. Um, and, uh, and so I was uh, involved in uh, microwave reconnaissance, which is a really weird industry, but it has to do with radio reception, um, antennas, um, direction finding antennas, horns. I mean, I was using horns and, you know, mm -hmm. one of you guys was born. Um, and... <laughs> And then um, I'm not saying which one, by the way, <laughs> but anyway, um, I, uh, you know, and so I'm into this microwave field now, basically helping design um, microwave receivers and in inclusive to that was some, something called spread spectrum. Hmm. And so we were trying to figure out how to receive spread spectrum signals and decode them. This was a very challenging task. Uh, military technology, you know, um, trying to figure out how to receive this intelligence from these uh, uh, noise-like signals. Um, that was fun. It was interesting. Um, the, the best part of that story was that um, the Cold War uh, basically ended. Um, the wall came down. As I recall, President Reagan was a, was a uh, president at that time in the U.S., and he had a problem. And the problem was that... Uh, um, he was going to have a big workforce problem in the United States because the military industry was going to implode. Um, so he had some really good ideas and they funded a bunch of grants into the military companies to look for opportunities to take military electronics and use them for commercial applications. Um, I don't know how I got all involved in this, but there's all sorts of weird little windy stories and I won't get into the details, but ultimately what happened was I got aligned into some of this spread spectrum work that was going on. 
And um, there were some guys with ideas. We did a whole bunch of testing in the labs. Like this stuff works. We could communicate using spread spectrum. And we can use these bands that are otherwise useless, like the band that's being used by our microwave ovens. I mean, you know, we basically couldn't, couldn't use those bands. So we had our big ideas. We did a bunch of lab work. And in combination with that, I was kind of getting tired of my company. Um, I, had, I had left a, a boss that I wasn't really aligned well with, gone into a different division. And then ultimately, they just put me back under that same boss after a while. I said, you know, I think I'm done here. Um, so right at that confluence of timing, um, I found a bunch of people who I had worked with at Harris Fernon. They had gone on to form this company called Western Multiplex. And I was out looking for a job and there were all sorts of really fun things going on at the time. It's like the very beginning of sort of really cool radio technology. Um, and so I got aligned into an opportunity to go work for this company, Western Multiplex. And lo and behold, they had already started working on um, spread spectrum microwave radio. Um, there weren't any regulations. There, there was no such thing as an ISM ban, by the way. <laughs> if there was one, it's not like what, what we know in a day. Um, nobody was doing anything like this, which was sort of cool. So I came into this company who'd been doing analog microwave radio, you know, a little bit of digital microwave radio. They were just getting ready to think about spread spectrum. They were working with the FCC to create re regulations that would allow that spread spectrum stuff to be used and trying to get ahead of the curve, which is really interesting, by the way, if you ever get an opportunity like this, you should take it, you know, where you're actually inventing equipment before the regulations exist that allow that equipment to be used. <laughs> you're the only one doing it. You're pushing it to make it happen. And then when the market opens, it's all yours, you know, so yeah, yeah. Um, it was pretty exciting. We built a product called the Lynx, L-Y-N-X. If anybody remembers it out here in Radio Land, uh, you know, good for you. I mean, you probably as old as me. Um, but we came out with a T1 spread spectrum radio at 2.4 gigahertz, um, you know, which was a brand new band at the time. And we were lobbying at that time to create the 5.8 gigahertz spectrum at the same time. The 900 megahertz spectrum sort of came along with it, but it wasn't really good for what we were trying to do. And we, uh, we had a lot of fun with Western Multiplex. Actually, I go back and look at all my days of working, the best times, you know, just creative genius and, and having a lot of good, good ideas and throwing a bunch of ideas to the, to the wall and see what sticks and make things happen. That's where, that's where it happened for me. Um, we were selling T1 radios like crazy. <laughs> we had to convince people that unlicensed didn't mean unreliable. That was uh, really tricky. People were using them temporarily to turn up the we're thing. We're still doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, you know, it kind of it kind of went from everybody thought it'd be unreliable. Then it became like, no, this stuff is really reliable. And then it became unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> and then. You know, technology had to make it reliable again, right? You know, it's like, yep. it's all about how you use it. But, you know, most of the, here's the crazy thing. Most of the systems I was putting in had like six foot dishes on them. Yeah. These are <laughs> ones, you know, maybe going seven miles or something with a six foot dish because that's what the cellular companies were used to doing. Mm. It was no big deal. I can put a four or six foot dish on a radio all day long and they could turn up a T1 service in a day they could turn up a cell site while they were literally waiting for the phone, the T1 to arrive. Well, the T1 didn't arrive for another year or two. And these guys would go, hey, cancel that T1. This radio has been working fine. Yeah. And so that got, us, that got us going. It took us a little while. Um, but we did two T1s after a bit. We did four T1s. Actually, against the better judgment of all my customers, they said, we'll never buy four T1s. That's way too much capacity for an unlicensed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a whole six gigabits, everybody. <laughs> or six megabits, I'm sorry, six megabits. Meg, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, risky stuff, but we did all that. Um, and then here comes the turn. So um, we were we were talking one day. We had all sorts of ideas. We came, we put SNMP in a radio. We were the first ones to ever do that. It's like, hey, somebody needs to do something that's publicly accessible in all these private network management systems. We put SNMP in a radio. We did a bunch of a bunch of fun things. We did the removable diplexer, which was this idea of, you know, you didn't have to have a channel plan. You could just remove the diplexer, uh, swap them, flip them over, that kind of thing. Um, 
we came, we finally, I don't know what caused us one day. I think I was reading up on something, this, this new thing called Ethernet. Uh, we were <laughs> in our building. I think we had just rewired our building from Token Ring. Token Ring, yeah, I was going to say. To Ethernet. And we said, you know, this Ethernet thing has promise. <laughs> yeah. uh, we think this could go somewhere. And so we started wondering if we could use radio to transport Ethernet. And there was a company, Rad, there's still Rad Communications, not to be confused with Rad Win. Mm -hmm. They had come out, they were starting to do these little boxes that did Ethernet to T1 conversion, that kind of thing. Um, they had a little little device called a Tiny Bridge. Does anybody here remember Tiny Bridge? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Vaguely <laughs> familiar, yeah. And it was basically an Ethernet to, to T1 or something like that converter. Um, so we bought a couple of those and we thought, hey, let's let's try something out. We stuck one of them in front of our T1 radio, put one literally in the wall plug of my office where the Ethernet connected to my computer, moved my computer across the room, put another one there, pointed a couple of radios maybe with paper clips connected to them to see if we could get <laughs> Ethernet across the room. And lo and behold, I could I could get onto uh, whatever it is we used to do with computers back then. I guess <laughs> um, ancient email. Um, we did that, and it was kind of it's like, oh, this works. Okay, so now we just need to sort of integrate that in the box, and now we have an Ethernet radio, sort of take a risk. So we did a two megabit Ethernet radio. It was built on our E1 product because that was more than T1, mm. and um that got us going we did a little college um it project we connected a local college to a, a local hosting site like five maybe six miles um probably still 2.4 giga gigahertz and it worked and that was to me like the beginning of the outdoor point-to-point -point wireless ethernet um Career goes on, you know, uh, Western Multiplex acquired a company called Proxim. Proxim's still in business. They changed their name to Proxim. Also, it's the story behind that. I ended up um, leaving that company and going to Exalt Communications. Mm, yeah. I was employee number six. I think, in Exalt. Um, a bunch of Western Multiplex people basically founded Exalt. And we were we did that run. We had a lot of fun at Exalt, too. We did, made a lot of really cool products, a lot of new brown groundbreaking stuff and then um the wheels kind of fell off there and i ended up doing some independent consulting um worked for a, a microwave construction company for a couple of years worked for fastback networks as a consultant for a couple of years and then ended up at avia um so that's kind of like that's a long history story but it's really interesting I, to me i go back and look at that and say you know if it weren't for the bass player in my band being into electronics if it weren't for yeah. my drummer's dad working for a microwave company <laughs> you know probably none of that stuff happens and you can sort of just watch that legacy and i've just really enjoyed this career it's been it's been a lot of fun that's yeah that's really cool i mean i have never seen or used a token ring network right so it's pretty <laughs> cool <laughs> yeah you're already ancient too so I know, yeah, I that's know. crazy <laughs> So you can only imagine how old yeah, I am. I feel younger now. Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> being on the show. This is fantastic. Yeah, well, man, man. See you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's in sepia tone. So no, no, we kid, we kid. So no, but that's that's a wild history. I mean, there's a lot of names there that I mean, a lot of people listening to this have probably never heard of, or you know, saw saw an old box somewhere, some documentation yeah. in a cell site somewhere, and they're like, hey, I've heard of these people somewhere. But yeah, the the name was you know the tsunami radios is what we so we yeah. branded we branded the Ethernet brand of the Lynx radio tsunami. Um, we had this idea for a marketing campaign behind that. So we just kind of like, okay, that's the name we're going to put on it. Um, there's this weird fun fact that came up in Wisp Talk not too long ago where somebody showed a picture of one. They said, I found one of these things sitting in my rack. And it has a, a teal colored front panel on it. And um, we got the San Jose Sharks here in the Bay Area in the early 90s. And I was a Sharks fan. Or I was a hockey fan. So I became a Sharks fan. And, uh, and their color was teal. So like I, I managed to sneak in the teal colored front panel onto the tsunami <laughs> because you know nobody knew that that was the connection. <laughs> That's awesome. That is wild. 
So, as you can imagine, the the state of the the license link market, especially in the the Wisp industry, has you know grown a lot tremendously. Yeah. Um, I mean, even just the last few years, it's just been wild to see the the growth from you know used to be oh single core, you know I got a six gig single core link, man. I got you know five hundred megs, seven hundred megs, whatever it may be. I got, man, this, this is all the bandwidth I'm gonna need on this site, and then it turned into dual core, and then it turned into overlaps. Now you know the big push into E band and everything else. So, you know, the, the industry, especially within the WISP market has just grown by leaps and bounds lately. So kind of want to get your insight as to the, the state of the market with license links, uh, specifically in the WISP industry. I know that's the area that your branch focuses on with IVI. So, I mean, IVI is a big, big public company all over the world, <laughs> but you know, your focus is primarily on the WISP market. So, you know, kind of give us some insight to see how you've seen this market progress and grow over the years, where it is now and where do you think it may be going? Yeah, that's a, that's a big wide uh, field. It's an interesting thing. So, I mean, I, I think, so first of all, yeah, you mentioned on the Aviat side, so we weren't even doing WISP business um, three years and two months ago. <laughs> um, that was something that, you know, sort of came along when I came to the company. It was a pitch. It was like, hey, you guys build these great outdoor radios. You're missing out on this huge market opportunity. Um, I think we could build this. And and so they, you know, they basically let me run. I said, okay, I'm gonna bring you on, let's see what you can do. Um, and it was, uh, the business side of it was a little tricky. It was like, well, we can't really, we, we build really high quality, perhaps high cost radios. So we really couldn't compete in the same fashion as other companies. So this, this concept of sell direct, support direct, um, cut the cost out, you know, try to find ways to just sort of streamline the business and, and, um, and run it that way. So I was a one man shop at Aviat for the WISP industry in North America for, for two years until about a year ago, um, when I picked up an engineer. So now I have an engineer, <laughs> um, and, and so now we're two, you know, and it's actually pretty astounding. I say that there's a whole lot of supporting cast. So I don't want to, I don't want to make that sound, uh, sure. incorrect. And there's a whole bunch of people who make it happen in the back end, but from the front end, as far as like customer interaction accounts and uh, designing links and getting them, you know, getting the right bills and materials together, it's just me and Ben Santa Maria. Um, and so it's been pretty, it's been a pretty fun ride, pretty successful. Um, we've catapulted from zero to hero pretty much, you know, the uh, double the market share of our number two. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, getting to the point of where you're at, you know, I, I think, so microwave radio has got its limitations. I work for a microwave radio company, so I'm just going to say out loud, you know, the biggest challenge is that the, the country you're in, no matter what country you happen to be in, is it has regulations regarding maximum channel bandwidth, and maximum channel bandwidth is going to scale to a certain amount of capacity. And we're pretty, I mean, I used to say we were pretty topped out in modulation back when we were doing 256 bomb, but we're <laughs> topped out in modulation right around 4096 bomb. You know, we could go higher, but the benefits are just just really diminished, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so you lose a whole bunch of threshold. You've got to have thinner spectrum and you get an itty bitty more data out of it. It's just not worth it, you know. Yep. Um, so I, I don't know that modulation is where it's at um, anymore. I mean, if somebody does come out with a whatever the next thing is, up, um, I frankly just don't think it's going to matter. So you're pushing, you know, 10 more bits or 100 more bits or whatever it is. It's just not, not going to do it. So the only place we have left to go is really stacking channels. Um, we put a whole bunch of channels, you know, get as much spectrum as we can from whatever bands we can get it all and put a whole bunch of radio up. And we're doing plenty of that. We've got customers using 6, 11, 18, maybe 23 added into that, you know, getting as much spectrum as they can on a given path and just getting as, all, all those channels bonded together and put all that capacity together in one big pipe if we can. Um, you know, spectrum availability is just really hard. It's getting harder and harder. You know, I, I remember visiting a Verizon guy in the late 90s and looking at his six gigahertz he had a string map up on his wall it was like 12 foot high 12 foot wide at the la basin he was in charge of for verizon and he had all his six gig uh, radios on strings and it looked like there wasn't room for another string 
yeah. <laughs> in the late 90s. <laughs> so, you know, you can only imagine what Spectrum looks like now. The, you know, the Spectrum coordinators do a great job, um, but they've got their work cut out for them and it's really getting harder and harder. So um, there's really only, you know, so we're doing, we're doing interesting things. Obviously, you know, we, we got into E-band, um, 80 gigahertz, 70, 80 gigahertz, lightly licensed radios. And we didn't really get into that band primarily so that we could go after the E-band market. What we saw was this thing we call multi-band market, right? But we could take E-band and combine it with microwave and supplant that together. And the concept basically being is you could get somewhat reliable 10 gigabits. You know, you get a 10 gigabit link and E-band and you could add some microwave to it. And then you've got aggregated capacity. So you're getting better capacity even during the light rain. You get the added capacity all the time not a failover, that kind of thing. And so trying trying to change that mindset to say you have true, reliable connections. But you guys know it like I do. Everybody wants to push technology as far as you can go, you know? (laughs) The spec sheet said 10 gigs, 10 miles. I want it. Yeah. How far does E-Ban go? (laughs) Yeah. How far can it go? Yeah. And here's the thing, you know, I think since I was a young man in this industry, everybody always says, you know, how far can I go? I said, well, you know, I can go 150 miles if that's what you want. Um, that's physics is not stopping us from going distance. Right. You know, it's distance. Regulation is. <laughs> yeah. Regulation and and ultimately reliability, right? I mean, the this is the thing that, you know, if I were to say, you know, one thing that nobody's ever used radios before, they got to understand this. You, you have to decide how reliable you want your connections to be. And you're in charge of that. You have the opportunity to make very reliable connections, but it usually takes money, you know, bigger dishes or like in your cases, narrower sectors, you know, whatever it might be, um, narrower channels, more of them, (laughs) you know, it's all these things that ultimately can pump up your reliability, but they all cost money. And so I have EBAN customers who are very uncomfortable doing two mile links. I have other E-band customers that are very comfortable doing nine mile ones. I think they're crazy. And I think, I mean, I would not do that if it were my network, but it's not my choice. You know, my, my role is to tell them what to expect. <laughs> and say, hey, listen, we put all the math we can put to this. We've, we've taken a lot of user experience. We try to apply that into it and say, hey, this is what we think you'll get. This is what is likely going to happen. And then you get to decide if that's good enough for you or not. Um, but getting back to Kayla, what you asked, it's kind of like, you know, where do we go from here? Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's tricky. I think I think this number one, somebody said it on one of your earlier podcasts is that if WISPs aren't considering how they do what the cell guys did way back when my town used to have one cell site in the middle of town. And then they built another one and then they split the difference and went in the middle and they cut down their power and they covered a smaller area and they reuse that frequency over and over by, by continuing to do cell splitting. And if you follow that model into the WISP industry, we're really facing this point, not just for the WISP point of multipoint of the edge access equipment, but also for the backhaul. Because you got technologies out there now at the edge, you know, let's talk about Teragraph or 60 gig or Tirana or any sort of high density, high capacity last mile solution. And, and you got, I've got customers who are doing everything. They're doing, you know, CBRS and five gig and 24, you know, they're, they're stacking their cell site so that they can do their short reach stuff on one technology and their medium reach stuff on other technologies and long reach technologies because you're just out of spectrum. <laughs> and so, um, I think it was Brandon Hardy or maybe one of the guys on, on your podcast who said, hey, you know, what we're really looking to try to do is keep our distance between sites, you know, within a certain range. Because, you know, if we can do that, then our backhaul can support it, the high capacity, and it gives us the range and reach that we need, you know, to deliver higher capacities out to the patch that we're trying to cover. And that's really, you know, it's, it's pretty simple when you think about it. You know, but ultimately, a lot of WISPs start off, you know, with the one site on the hill or or the one in town. And and then you go do your second one. And I think it's right around the second one <laughs> or maybe the third one where you have to start. Be, if you want to be in business for another five or 10 years, 
you need to start strategically thinking about exactly where are those locations going to be that would leverage me being able to do things like cell splitting and things like cutting down these distances so I can deliver more capacity uniformly. The other part of that is, is I guess, protection, you know, having multiple routes. I mean, I know a lot of our risks are using uh, maybe more than one fiber provider or fiber from the east and fiber from the west and coming in and that kind of thing. That's great. But in your in your in the whole topology of the backhaul, that's becoming more and more critical as well. Um, so where are we going? You know, I think right now we do multiband in one box with 10 gigs and a microwave radio that can give you two channels. That's about a gig and a half of capacity. So when it rains heavy, you can still get a gig and a half. You get an extra capacity along the way. That's not bad. Um, we're, we just launched some new technology that can make that even better. Um, it's a little more complex. It's a little more money. But we can push that 10 gigabits a little bit harder. Um, we can push the gig and a half a little bit harder as well. Of course, that just means either some customers are getting better reliability on the distance they find, or everybody just wants to go further now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, isn't it always the same? It's like, oh, now how far can I push it? It's like, hey, man, that's up to you. Uh, I know what I'm comfortable with. I'll tell you what I what it's what I think it's going to do. You get to decide. Um, I think we're just going to see more of that. I mean, it's maybe pretty simple. We're going to see you know start seeing stacking of e band channels. We have a two channel e band that is 20 gigabits, but if you run it in a cross pole fashion. You can run it at 10 gigabits and get 13 dB of extra system gain. 13 dB is a lot of system gain, guys. Yeah, you know, a lot. so we can take a 10 gigabit circuit that used to do, you know, say four miles reliably, whatever that means to a particular customer, and we can make that do six miles. Or for that matter, we can just do better at hanging on to 10 gigabits over a shorter distance. Um, I think really everything is up. You know, <laughs> um, where the spectrum is, is higher frequency. Higher frequencies don't propagate very well. You're going to yeah. need shorter distances. The only way you're going to get high capacity is shorter distance. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's playing well. I think it's just naturally kind of, uh, you know, the, the pieces are falling into place because really the, the point to multipoint at a very lower EIRP limit at these higher modulation rates are forcing these cell sites to be even smaller than, let's say, the, the, the minimum distances that you, you hope for on your, your backhauls, right? So it's actually playing quite well where it's like, you know, going to be a mile or something like that. So you're talking maybe two mile backhauls, right, on this E-band stuff, which is, you know, a good, a good spot for it to be in, in on average, I would think, in, you know, wet and of course in dry environments, but even splitting that in the middle sounds like it's, it's all coming together. Yeah, I think so. Especially if we're talking about like six gig um, access, you know, that distance plays very nicely with an E-band backhaul, like you said, that sort of doubled the distance of the cell site, right? Yep, yep. Um, yeah, so those physics play pretty nicely. And if if capacity, you know, I, who, who'd ever think we'd be where we are today? You know, I, when I think back to my two megabit story, right? <laughs> yeah. That was enough for an entire college. <laughs> I was there in an service, you know. Now today, you know, i got a whole lot more than that coming to my house. So, you know, I, I got to think that I know a lot of people think that capacity is kind of topped out, but we would have we would have said that two decades ago. And and so, you know, there's always going to be technology. I mean, I've joked about this a little bit, but, you know, I want to have my holographic cousin over for dinner. <laughs> you know, I mean, why not? I mean, you can mark my words. That's going to happen. <laughs> So, you know, if I it's your have fault. My What's that? <laughs> it's your fault. That's why there's this push to put ungodly amounts of bandwidth to everybody's houses for, for things like that. <laughs> exactly. Come on. Sounds, where's where's but, the real know, human experience? You don't need bandwidth to have somebody in real life come visit and have dinner with you. you know, I'm right, kidding. Right. No, I, I know, but it's, it's, but we never used to do this kind of thing, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's, you know, two decades ago, it was fantasy land that we could look down at our wrist and see our buddy talking to us. But we can do that now. And and was was that the Dick Tracy watch? Right? Wasn't that the thing back in the day? Like that was yeah. yeah. I was actually alive then. That was the sixties. <laughs> 
I wasn't. <laughs> I'm surprised you know that. You're a good historian. I'm yeah, we, we know why why people back in the 60s had those like crazy ideas and stuff like that for like talking to my yeah. watch, you know? Well, I, I don't live too far from San Francisco, so you know, there was a lot, <laughs> a lot of imagination going on back then. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> but, you know, I um, yeah, I, I don't want to like just throw the question away and say, hey, you know, technology, you know, there's probably another another element to this. And there was something I kind of I was thinking about what we might talk about. One of the things I wanted to kind of emphasize is there was I forget exactly who you were talking to about like the rise of early 11 gigahertz, you know, inexpensive licensed radios yep. and what's, yep. what was going to happen, right? Uh, and you know, notably the AF11 and B11 kind of game changers for the Wisps, you know, and I and I honor that because. Um, you know, I used to drive a pretty bad car before I made some money and I had to make some money to get a better car and, and I had to drive to work. So guess what? I'm going to buy the bad car. You know, I'm not saying they're bad radios, but I'm just saying, you know, that you might not afford what you want at the time that you want it. And you kind of have to build yourself up and get that. And I think what I'm trying to do with a lot of the wisps is educate them to understand that the choices that they make early are going to potentially impact their ability to grow their wisp later. Yes. Preach, brother, preach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Preach. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's tough because somebody makes a decision to say, well, I'm going to do this thing and I'm not going to name names, but just say, you know, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to, and, and that's where I've already done that thing. That's what happens to me. Is I get the phone call and say, oh, I got this going on and show me their network. And I go, man, this is, this is going to be tough. Uh, to to change one link to a higher capacity, to add one more link to your network, guess what you're going to have to do? Tear it all out and start over. That's the bad news. And and that's happened. I've had a guy who had three links to something and he wanted to upgrade one of them. And I said, guess what? We're going to have to upgrade all three. There is no way you're going to be able to do this. Uh, Backed himself into a corner with his, his original network design, not by going cheap, but by going cheap and not, seeking some education to understand how the decisions he was making could impact his growth in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that that's, you know, that's kind of like my final offer and mission in my life is to say, Hey, you know, I'm here, I'm very embedded in the wisp industry. I have a lot of passion for it. I want to do as much to educate the wisps on making good decisions, not to buy aviat equipment. That's great. You know, also plenty of radios. Yep. I want to make sure that, um, People aren't wasting, you know, or not thinking about where they are going, you know, or where they might end up going, you know, in a short amount of time. If they're successful, let's say, let's, let's face it, all these folks, they would like to be successful. So imagine if you are successful and how will your network look at that point? And thinking about that and sort of working backwards, well, then what can I do today to implement technology in such a way that I'm not wasting my money? I'm spending it wisely and it allows me that growth opportunity as I go. It's very complex and we're not going to cover all that, all that detail, but in my world of backhaul, it it can be done. You can start off with those low cost equipment and you can do it in such a way that it allows you to build your business and then move your business up the chain as you, as you start getting more capacity, more subscribers. Um, But there's also ways to do it wrong. And that's really, it's really a challenge. Yeah, it is. And education is the key on everything. And we're seeing it uh, more and more where, you know, some manufacturers are stepping up to the plate and doing the right thing. And it's like you said, it's not about selling your products, it's about doing the right thing because it makes the industry sustainable um, and, you know, all around, you know, benefits everybody, including yourself. So, you know, naturally, uh, there's a, a natural benefit for you in that. But that's not the goal of, you know, doing it. So it's, it's great to see you guys doing that, too. Yeah, thanks. Now, I, I, I mean, sort of being that certified old guy, whatever we said at the beginning, I, I feel like that's, that's the point for me. You know, at this point, I'm kind of in the twilight of my career. I look and say, well, what can I do? You know, this decision to go back into the wisp industry again was really a decision for myself to say, hey, I have some great technology. I can educate. Um, I can be assistance to a lot of companies, have a lot of input. Um, to help this industry grow. 
And, you know, who knew the pandemic was coming and who knew that a whole bunch of broadband funding was coming or whatever other, other things coming to the table together that could help, you know, move this industry as well. It's been magical. Um, you know, that I, I, I wanted to tell a story. Um, how, how did this all start? And, you know, the, there was a project I worked on. So we built this thing called the tsunami <laughs> and, and way back when I got a phone call, I think from a guy who was running, a, a, the a County office of education in a rural part of California, very poor part of California. And he, he had this vision and you know, not, this was not my vision. It was his, he says, Hey, you know, I want to find a way to connect the kids that go to my schools you know, because if I can connect them, it was like the early idea of digital divide, but it didn't really, there was, those words didn't exist back then. We're talking like 1996 here, guys. So, you know, before the internet was really a thing, um, and, or, well, as it was becoming a thing, I guess is probably the right way to say it. Um, but he had this vision. He said, you know, how could we do this? And so I got together with him. Um, he'd heard about us. Um, we sat down and, and, and designed an internet network for his school district, um, you know, using sticks and stones and, you know, <laughs> paper clips, I guess, you know, um, and we, uh, we, we actually realized his vision, um, and it, and it had a deep impact on me. I was like, wow, you know, I can actually doing my job, I can make a difference to a community of impoverished people. Um, that was huge in my, in my career, you know, just to say, okay, I want more of that, <laughs> you know, um, because it, it ultimately, you know, I don't want to get too philosophical, but ultimately I hope everybody, you know, watches this podcast or, you know, who, you know, thinks about that. It's like, what am I really, do why am I really doing what I'm doing? What is going to matter uh, when I'm done doing what I'm doing? And I think the WISP industry is just the heart of that to me, you know, especially on the technology side. There's probably other, there's other industries that are as well, but I'm a technology guy. I'm into radio. It's like, wow, WISP industry, there's nothing better because we could do this and we are doing it. And it's just super exciting. It's just, it's, it's just so much fun to be even just a small part of connecting people who otherwise wouldn't be connected and then giving them an opportunity um, to be, um, you know, to uh, contribute more, to learn more, uh, all to be connected more, you know, even if it's just a, a Zoom call with grandma, you know, heck, you know, that's, that's amazing. Um, so it's, it's, you know, that to me is like, I want to do as much of that as I can before I'm done. Now I've got myself contemplating my whole existence and a small existential <laughs> crisis. So, but it's coming back around. I'm coming back around. They're like, yeah, hey, no, it's all, it's all good. It's all you good. I think so. if, if you made, you know, if you continued to make a lot of barbecue, but you shared more barbecue. Yeah. That, yep. You know, <laughs> Hey, bacon. It's, it's, share yeah. your bacon. I won't share I the bacon. Anything, I share any, your bacon. Anything else, I will share. The bacon is a little. I hold it a oh, little close God. though. So, <laughs> but no, you know what you say is. I mean, it's so many people are in this because of that. Because they want to make their community better. They want to make their neighborhood better, and just to to provide information. You know, it's the best way that we can do it now, and it's what drives Tassos to me. And you know, so many people at RF Elements just being a part of that and being a part of something. So that's that's really great it's extremely motivating yeah and cool toys yeah we get to we get to play with technology which is really fun too um yeah i was thinking about there were a couple things also um yeah i talked a lot about radio but i i noticed you know like um uh, i'm gonna say i think it was chris johnson who was talking about dc power and stuff like this it's like yep yeah, listen, listen closely, <laughs> you know, grounding. I think Josh was talking about grounding. Chris was talking about DC powers. Like these are the kinds of things you know, these fundamental things that if you start off right and you learn these things, you know, I mean, it's just as important to learn things like routing and natting. And, yeah. you, know, you know, I mean, there's all these networking things as well. I'm not all that good at that. I'm good on the RS side, but the DC power train is the train I've been on for years. It's like, Hey, everybody, the days of POE, you know, that was that was fun while it lasted. But um, when you're properly applying POE, that's fine. But for things like 
backhauls that are doing more than a gigabit capacity, I, I still wonder why some of my customers are using PoE. It's like, hey, you use fiber, we can use DC power. It'll be cheaper and it'll be more reliable. Wouldn't you like yeah. both of those things? <laughs> You know, well, uh, a lot of people get tunnel vision, you know, only understanding how to do some way. And some of it's just not that sexy, you know, so, you know, your multiplayer, I've got the, the brand, this new system and these new standards and I can add, you know, cause I think I put up an access point, I put up all these clients, this immediate business, you know, I'm, I'm raking in the money or they're, they're, you know, the backhauls, you know, a lot of people don't pay that much attention to backhauls, especially in the beginning. Cause they're like, well, okay, yeah, I'll get the traffic there somehow, you know, or, or when I get the clients added, I'll get it there. And I was like, well, that's not how the math works, but you know, people will, will sweat the details. So do I have five nines here? Do I have six nines? It's the most ultra reliable radio ever. And then have some sort of chicken wire janky nonsense for their DC power distribution <laughs> or their power distribution in general. Right. So, you know, you got six nines out of your link. It doesn't do you any good when your power is out two or three times a month because you're on a bad leg or something like that. So it's an all encompassing thing you've got to think about in terms of not just performance and numbers, but I mean, your customers service and your, your reliability your your reviews and feedback and stuff like that you know i was i, I mean it's so much i admire the wisp just because there's so there's so many unique technologies that you actually have to master right you know you can't be just good at ip you know you can't be just good at radio you can't be just good at dc power and grounding you know or site you know, site construction or something like I think got to hit all those things. And on top of that, marketing, and customer service and, you know, building, you know, my, you know, it's like, well, the list gets long and it's like, but um, we've got some pretty impressive people, you know? So, and, and you know, that doesn't always have to fall on one person. Ideally you can hire out and get some consultants. There's a lot of good companies that have popped up that are kind of like addressing, you know, some of those. And you're not, a, you know, you're not an IP uh, wizard. Well, there's IP wizards around, you know, you can, get get one as a consultant or or whatever or rent one if you want to call it that um and you can or you can start learning you know if you i i mean one of the things i'd say is you know i mean on that front is if you don't know something and you hired somebody to help you do something you're doing yourself a disservice by not standing right next to them while they're doing it <laughs> because you know ultimately you need to learn more about that thing that you're hiring out so you can start cutting some costs and doing it yourself, you know, and getting a little further along. You're paying somebody to do some some work for you. It'd be a good idea, good opportunity to try to learn while you're while you're doing it. Yeah, understanding the solution. So if you've ever got to make a pivot to someone else or, you know, fix it on your own and stuff like that. So I mean, it's one of the great things is we've seen standardization is probably the wrong word for it, but we're seeing we're seeing more and more people kind of get on the same page with whether it be power distribution, surge protection, finally, you know, the, the network and building your rings, like, you know, some of these things kind of pop up a lot more reliably and regularly than they used to in the past. So that's great. And there's a lot of consultants available, a lot of shared knowledge, more and more vendors are getting to be, you know, educational, not from a, Hey, this is just our product, but this is how our product also fits in the ecosystem. That's great. But at the same time, you know, you do understand you've got understand the nuts and bolts and you don't have to be the electrician where you are but you're probably gonna need a little bit of those electrician skills or you know be the network engineer that's like yeah sometimes you gotta pick up a shovel it's what happens so <laughs> well yeah you know we're the three of us are probably um you know our relationship is sort of built on the fact that things like with talk exist for example and and that um that is a beautiful thing if you really look at it, because you've got, you know, a few hundred consultants um, available to you at, 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 with one post, right? You just say, hey, I need to know more about this who can help me or I've got, I've got this problem or I'm facing this, this situation. And you've got vendors and other WISPs all coming in and saying, hey, you know, here's, here's my perspective on it. Now, some of that, you got to weed through it. You know, you're going to get... 10 different answers from 10 different people. Um, but that's okay too. You know, you, you have to, you have to weed because it's yeah. not, so it's not always a one solution fits all, you know, uh, it, it never is, you know, say, so, well, you know, tell me more about your specific situation. You know, there's some, there's some folks on the group that I love about that. They'll say, well, you know, you, before we can answer your question, you got to answer these 17 questions because yeah. their specifics matter. 
Um, you know, we can give you a nice general answer, but the more information you tell us about what you're facing, the more we'll be able to kind of hone in and tell you what the right thing is or what the best thing is for you. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is going to be trial and error. A lot of it is going to be, well, we tried this and it didn't work. And, and so we're going to try something else. Hopefully it didn't kill you, um, mm -hmm. along the way, you know? So, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, and that's where, again, kind of getting to my own perspective. It's like, I'm, I'm pretty much a, a free service available to anybody and everybody, you know, it's, um, yeah, I'm here to sell radio for a living for my company. But, you know, you want 15 minutes of my time to ask me questions, you know, general questions about something that I know something about, I will share with you all day long. Um, and I've joined some of those mentor communities and things like that. And it's like, you know, I, I don't, it does, it does very little for me, frankly. <laughs> um, but hey, you know, if I'm helping somebody answering some questions here and there, most people know how to reach me. It's not that hard. Um and, uh, and, you know, and you can just ask a bunch of people, you know, you ask people, well, who helped you, you know, whatever, you know, there's a lot of that, a lot of that that's going on. You guys are getting tagged every day in different posts. I'm getting tagged in every day in different posts. Yeah. And I think that's the magic of a lot of, that's like the good side of social networking, right? Is that we can say, Hey, I know somebody, you know, I'm not very much help to you, but I know somebody who could be helpful to you. And this is the person. Correct. And, um, you know, when you see three or four people all kind of directing everybody to one person, that's kind of a, a show to say, well, that person, probably the person I need to be talking to. <laughs> yeah. A lot of really good information, a lot of insanity too. So that's my, my <laughs> old man sort of uh, dad joke, about, like, especially things like West talk. It's like, yeah, a lot of good information there, but the S and R is kind of poor sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. and then if they don't understand it. that joke, then I'm like, oh, you got a lot more reading to do. So, yeah. but, um, anyways, they're figuring it out though. They're figuring yeah. it out. <laughs> so, back to the a little less uh, the big idea perspective and a little more to the practical perspective is so the new list that's out there that's like, all right, cool. Uh, you know, my five gig backhauls, they worked really well for what I was doing, but I need to take that next step. Right. And you know, yeah. okay. All I hear is license. I just see dollar signs. I'm freaking out. So what do you, what would you say to the new wisp out there that's thinking about it or doesn't know like what to do or what are their next steps? You know, what are the things I have to consider with like, I don't know, coordination, channel planning and stuff, just kind of walk through what does it mean to buy a license link beyond just buying a couple of boxes of widgets? and putting them in the sky yeah that's that's great um there unfortunately there's a lot of there's a lot of it is complicated and it can be a little bit scary um but you know if we were to say every country has different regulations and every country has different bands that are available so you know i'm a usa north america guy so you know excuse me if i start using you know usa numbers here but the th everything that I'm talking about applies everywhere else. It's just the numbers might be slightly different. We have a situation here in the United States where if you look at your license bands and license microwave bands, there are really only two bands that you want to focus on. That's 11 gigahertz and 18 gigahertz. And the reason those two bands have become the ones you want to focus on is because they have the widest channel band that's available from the SEC. Point number one, learn that. Now, what other bands are available to me? There's other bands out there. There's six gigahertz lower, six gigahertz upper, 23 gigs. Some people have access to 13 gigs. There's some other bands out there. But guess what? All those bands have narrower channels. So all those bands are going to deliver less capacity. Who wants less capacity? You know, it's going to be basically the same amount of hardware, the same amount of cost, same amount of infrastructure. Everybody wants more capacity. So if you want capacity, 11 gigahertz and 18 gigahertz is the place to go. That's point number one. The channel bandwidths are 80 megahertz wide, by the way. And, and there's different vernacular out there. And something that's important to touch on is that understanding what you're hearing and the definition of what you're hearing is really important. Somebody says, you know, this is the capacity you're getting. Well, what do you mean by capacity? I mean, that's a kind of very basic number, very basic thing. But everybody has different definitions of capacity. There's full duplex capacity. There's aggregate capacity. There's half duplex capacity. Uh, you, you have to mix then understand the difference between things like time division duplex and frequency division duplex. And what does that mean to me? I'm not going to get into all those details, but most of the microwave radios, all but one, frankly, are, are uh, frequency division duplex. Um, the one that isn't is the Mimosa B11. The Mimosa B11 has a, has a, um, a mode that operates in TDD. 
Um, understanding what that means to you and why that's important is, is, is good. We won't get into the details. I'll teach you if you need to, need, need to know more. Um, but um, ultimately then, you know, in the, in the United States, we have this really cool thing, very helpful thing called frequency coordination. Um, other countries don't necessarily benefit from what we benefit here, where we've got a fairly organized spectrum that's intended to basically allow you to operate without inter interfering with others and nobody interfering with you. It's not perfect. Some people might be running rogue systems. Sometimes it's just weird physics that cause things to interfere with one another that nobody could have predicted. Um, but it's pretty darn good. Um, I mean, literally well more than 99% of the things that are designed out there are working interference free. So that's great. And if you, the other thing that's important to understand there is in frequency coordination, who you hire to do that business matters. Um, some, some companies have better technology than others as far as de uh, determining what frequency channels can do what. And so um, that's another lesson that people can learn, you know, along the way to say, hey, this, this coordinator told me there's no channels available, or this coordinator told me that I can get the channels, but I have to turn down my power or something like that. Um, or I have to use narrower channels and I'm now not going to get the capacity I wanted. All those things happen. And sometimes they happen even when you put the best coordinator in it because you're in a really crowded area and you just can't get the spectrum. But sometimes a better coordinator can find you a channel that somebody else couldn't find because they just have better technology. They have better computing power. They do, they do different things to figure that out. Um, so frequency coordination is a really important part of it here in the U.S., um, and any other country that has frequency coordination. Um, and then I think, um, let's see, what was the other thing I want to try to try to cover? I, you know, these definitions things are important. Again, when you say capacity, it's important to ask somebody, does that mean full duplex capacity, like both directions simultaneously? Does that mean aggregate capacity? That's hurdle number one. The hurdle number two is like, what do you mean by capacity? How is that being measured? Because um, somebody, company A measures it one way, company B measures it another, they might actually, the one with a higher number might actually be lower than the other one. So for real, you know, so asking the questions of like, how is that capacity measured? Uh, you know, how, uh, what am I uh, really going to get? Like if I run a speed test or if I run a, you know, a, a true uh, layer one capacity test in both directions simultaneously, what am I really going to get out of this technology? Uh, I think what I'm getting to is, um, unfortunately, a lot of marketing has come into, uh, it's been in the industry for a long, long time, actually, yeah. the beginning of Wi -Fi, you know, 11 megabits Wi-Fi was never 11, <laughs> right? yeah. never was, you know, it's just some number. And then 54 megabits came out. It's like 54 didn't mean anything either. And it just meant it faster, but how, how fast it really was. And unfortunately, I wouldn't say that people lie, but they're using some number. They're tagging something to it. There might be an asterisk or a footnote somewhere or you can determine what that number really means. Um, but you have to do your, you have to do your research. You have to ask the questions. I don't think anybody's going to lie to you if you ask them, does that mean both directions simultaneously? Is that an aggregate number? How is that number measured? Those are good questions to ask because otherwise you're not comparing apples to oranges. I think yeah. the other thing, um, this is another really hot topic and it has to do with propagation and prediction. And, I've been an RF guy, so actually most of the science work that I've ever done in my whole career has to do with propagation and prediction. And I built calculators and, and link planners and all these kinds of things. And it's a tough science and there's different, um, there's different mechanisms to estimate how uh, RF signal is going to work over time given air pressure and rainfall and, and other things like temperature variation when you're going over water, all these different factors. And um, different manufacturers may um, hone in on a particular science um, to apply to a prediction of how something's going to work. Some manufacturers may apply a science that makes the numbers look as good as possible. And other manufacturers might apply a science that make them look as conservative as possible. And so once again, you're left with two different, maybe two different manufacturers showing you something. One looks better than the other on paper. But if you're not paying close attention and not asking questions like, well, I wasn't comparing apples and apples. And that to me, you know, this is really, it's kind of a little bit sad. I'm going to shed a tear, but all these things I've said is that you have to ask the, you have to be knowledgeable enough to ask the questions 
to know whether or not what you're comparing is a real comparison. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you guys see this on your set too. Right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's the magic of gain in marketing. <laughs> you know, for us is basically what what all that comes down to. And it's 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 funny that you you mentioned that because you know we see it a lot also with speeds, right? And and people listing the fi rates, you know, versus you know what you actually get, and uh, that's very misleading. And and uh, you know. Uh, I think people do that just because of the reason you said they do, right? Or why they would is to make it look faster to the unknowing, uneducated customer. They want to choose that over somebody else. And, uh, you know, well, it is what it is. But we, we try and yeah, educate Yeah, you know, them. I mean, it's for manufacturers, excuse me, uh, for manufacturers, I think, you know, you're either playing the long game or you're playing the short game, you know. And, you know, my from my perspective, it's like, why would you – why would you actively mislead your client into what some solution is going to give you to get a sale to only know that on the back end of that sale, the customer is going to be dissatisfied. And then he's going to tell all of his friends that he's dissatisfied. It's like, you know, it's a, it's a losing game. Um, I'm not saying lie. Cause I don't actually think anybody lies. No, <laughs> I mean, fire rates are fire rates. Right. So there's yeah, no lying. There. Right. Yeah. It's real. Um, yeah. but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You know, it's just like when I said somebody comes back and says, Well, how far can this go? I said, Well, you know, I can go 100 miles. You know, it's like, Yeah, yeah, we're done, right? You're going to buy my stuff because it goes 100 miles, man. You know, no, that's not the end of the conversation. Um, I think, uh, I think Josh had said something like, You know, he, it depends. <laughs> and, and as an engineer, you know, that's like my, that's my, like my line It's like my line in life. Cause it's real. It's like almost every single question can be answered by the answer. It depends. And we have a and, new hashtag, Ken. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> hashtag probably, depends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's, let's, yeah, let's not get there yet. I'm not quite <laughs> Not that old. Oh, that, yeah. dual, that has dual meaning, right? Okay. Sorry. I'm headed, I'm headed there. You know, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, we'll put it. We'll put hashtag it depends. So there we go. That's, 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 that's so much better. That's so much better. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I think that, you know, you have, like, like I said a little bit about the interaction in with talk is you have to ask more questions. You have to give more information. Um, and unfortunately, I think, you know, you either learn the hard way or, or, you know, a different way, but learning these things that we talked about, like, well, what does, what does that mean? You know, is it, is it full duplex? Is it aggregate capacity? How is capacity being measured? How are you doing this prediction? What technology are you using? Is that a conservative prediction or an aggressive prediction? Um, how did you come up with those numbers? I don't, you know, I don't understand it. That's good. You know, don't just take somebody's word for it and say, okay, well, this guy says that this thing's going to work. Um, like, well, you know, I, we, we put out these really complex, uh, charts of how we think a radio is going to um, operate over time. And a lot of people just say, well, you know, if you guys say it's good, it's good enough for me. Well, that's, that's great. If you trust me, if I, if I built up that trust, that's wonderful. Um, but that, that rule doesn't apply to everybody. <laughs> you shouldn't <laughs> everybody that gives you something to say, oh, it's going to work the way I tell you it's going to work. Um, they might not even know. Um, and I think this, Um, One of the things leaking into this conversation is just the impact of um, uh, it's hard for me to describe to somebody to say, hey, listen, you know, when you look on your weather app on your phone and it says it's going to it's got a 70 percent chance of rain tomorrow. um, What does that mean? You know, it's maybe even in your town, you know, it's like you pulled up your town out in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz says 70% chance of rain tomorrow. What does that mean? It means that there's a 70% chance of rain is going to rain somewhere in my town tomorrow. <laughs> you know, how hard, how long is it going to affect me at my house? I don't know those answers based on that little metric. And, um, and I use that analogy important because weather is so impactful to wireless. And as we start going up in the higher frequencies, even more so, U band is very affected by rain, 60 gigahertz, even more affected by rain. Um, and as we get into higher frequency bands, we haven't talked about it yet, but there will be technology above 80 gigahertz that becomes commercialized. 
um, this rainfall and distance and reliability thing is going to become really, really important. And how does somebody accurately predict how that technology is going to work? The answer is they will not. Because you can't predict the weather. I mean, we've got thousands and thousands of scientists all over the world trying to predict weather. And a fraction of those science, uh, scientists are trying to take how does that weather affect microwave? <laughs> And, and if I know I can watch the five o'clock news and watch the weather report and watch it be wrong more than it's right, then you can only imagine the fraction of scientists that are trying to take that information and apply it to the physics of wireless or even wronger, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the problem with so many of these historical models is like, really, that's great, but, you know, 100 okay. year average. You know, yeah, it ballparks, and you've got a central sort of comparison point from system A to system B, but doesn't necessarily mean that's the truth, especially as wackadoo as weather's been getting over the last several years. So it's well, yeah. I mean, one one of these parts of this conversation is a little bit about what you might call climate change. You know, uh, in my lifetime, I think weather's become more severe, whatever that means. The other, so yeah, I think the hundred year model things are just not what they could be the other part of that is just simply like microclimates and just weirdness you know it's like um, yeah my town you know we're using some pin in the map to say well you know average rainfall is x millimeters an hour for this duration of time but that's in like in your county or maybe even your state you know it's over some very broad region and it not and and one link in your network that's adjacent to another link in your network might experience something completely different <laughs> And they're adjacent to one another. Mm. And because one happens to be going like with the valley and the other one's going across the valley or something like that. And it's like, you know, that is not easy to figure out. And so, you know, I, I think ultimately what we see is um, we can do all these predictions, <laughs> but they're only predictions. And that's, that's a very hard part of um, the discussion that I might have with the customer to say, hey, this is the best prediction we can make and we've actually been a little bit conservative about it but guess what your mileage is still going to vary you know your uptime is still going to vary um and nothing says anything better than experience says it you know ultimately you you're gonna have to use this technology kind of find out what it does in your area and take that knowledge and use it to adjust your expectations as you go forward um that part of it is actually a really difficult part of the conversation because I, I consider myself, you know, pretty high science when it comes to RF propagation. Um, and yet I look at this as like a big mystery. I mean, we do the best we can with the tools that we have in front of us. Um, but I frankly think that's not going to get any better. It's only going to get harder. Reminds me of the very first 11 gig link I ever touched or did. It was 15 years ago and way too far. I mean, I forget how far it was, but it was obnoxiously far. You know, 256 Quam radio, kind of old school, but it was oriented uh, north the the north to east like exactly where the storm bands would come in that exact same way so when you look on paper and the calculations you're like oh you got five nines it's great but when that one band would come through it would be i don't know 10 miles of just nothing but that one band for 30 minutes as it pushed through so you <laughs> and know it just sits there and it right just sits there in the entire band <laughs> so if that link would have been shifted a little bit like this it would have run fine but it didn't so it's just you see some of that weirdness but yeah, yeah and the computer, I think maybe some things will get a little better. Certainly things like LiDAR data has helped us with things like line of sight analysis and, and maybe even, you know, I think we'll even get better at determining how things propagate, especially like in your area of the, of the expertise is things like how things propagate non-line of sight. I don't deal with a lot of non-line of sight stuff. I think that part of the science actually has come quite a long ways, even just in the last, you know, five years or so. Um, and there's some great, you know, great emerging tools that will help you determine, you know, tree clutter and, and propagation at certain frequencies. But when we get to backhaul, <laughs> you know, none of that edge stuff is going to matter if you can't get the, if you can't get the connection to the. So, the so price. nobody asks you if you can do a backhaul through how many trees you can go through like we get all the time. Oh, right? I don't know. I'm sure he gets a few. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> yeah. I just have this one building in the way. Is that okay, Ken? Yeah, 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 no. Yeah, the in, in my world where I'm living today, and I've got the answer is no. 
we basically just don't allow you. We try to not let you um, have anything that is in full clearance, yeah. you know? Um, and I, I spent a few days with a customer like a couple of weeks ago. He didn't, I'm no, no disparity to this guy. He just had never figured out like, well, how do I figure out whether or not I have clearance? <laughs> it's like, well, that's a great question. And the answer is hard. You know, we're, we're going to like look on Google Maps. We're going to pull up all the different tools that you have available to your desktop. You've got my tool. You've got Cambium's tool. You've got the, yep. the ISP toolbox thing that Facebook put out. You've got uh, CN Heat. You know, who knows? You got all these uh, tower coverage. I'm not trying to leave brand name. You, know, you got all these different things. I said, let's look at them all. Mm. So that we shouldn't leave anything out that's available at our fingertips because we can do this sitting at our desktops in about half an hour, we could look at five or six different um, tools that tell us what they think it looks like versus getting in the truck, driving out there and trying to figure it out, you know, by hand, which we might still end up doing. But when we do that, we'll be smarter about it, right? We'll know exactly where to go, exactly where to look for and figure it out from there. And we walked all the way down that path. It's like, okay, we all think that this path is clear. All right, let's hope it is, you know. (laughs) Last check might be, let's go climb your tire with a pair of binoculars, you know, or let's go drive to these three points on your path and figure out whether those trees are really there or not and how tall they are. And how to, how do you measure the height of a tree is the next question. It's like, okay, well, I could teach you how to do that too. You know, it's like, or these are things that some people don't know and that's okay. You got to ask the question and find out from somebody who does know and, and, and walk down that path. Uh, I, that was a, uh, obvious uh, pun there. Walk down that path. Um. Yeah, yeah, we got <laughs> it. So walk a walk, walk a walk a. I'll be here all day, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but yeah, yeah. What, i mean what you say is so true like there's been so many hours that i've spent trolling google maps and being like all right i'm at this high point oh thank god there's a street view so i could drop it oh but this picture is from 2003 so is there anything here or not <laughs> or the the first time i got my my new whiz bang uh nikon forestry meter so i could get back and pop the heights within a few feet of accuracy i'm like this thing's amazing that first time it paid for itself like the first week i had it because the engineer's like yeah yeah. we got we got line of sight we're good you know the the model says 50 foot trees here and i went out there and they were like 120 and i'm like nope this Jeez. is <laughs> this is not gonna work bro so but it's and i mean it sucks because you almost have to kind of burn yourself you know and especially on the you know two or three miles is pretty easy to figure out if you've got you know visual or radio line of sight keeping in mind that for null zones of things so on and so forth but right. You know, there's there's just so much. So I think, you know, I've built a lot of links. I've sold a lot of links. I've helped people do a lot of comparisons. And I would definitely say the the physical mapping of that link, right? That's where people get blown up a lot. They're like, oh, it clears this ridge, right? Well, this ridge is 30-year-old shuttle data, right? And there's buildings there, trees. So you got to understand a full path analysis there. You've got to understand what the metrics and reliability numbers and throughputs that report's putting out as well. And you got to fully understand the bomb because there's so many times where, you know, an uneducated person, you know, they're used to buying stuff without my loot, not a lot of nuance, right? So, Hey, this truck has this much horsepower and carry this much stuff. Okay, great. So I'm going to buy this truck. It does what it does. But you know, there's just so much nuance in a lot of these links and, or they'll, they'll be like, I want 10 miles. I don't want a gig. Okay. And you know, some sales guy out there somewhere, Oh, here's a bomb with two foot dishes, no power supplies, no cable. It's just radios and dishes. <laughs> and then you look at a property engineer solution that includes your cabling, your power supplies, your surge protectors, your optics, your SFP modules that are temp rated and not Alibaba specials. Like all these things are like, Hey, this is, well, it's got four foot dishes or six, six foot dishes. And this is why my price is three or four times as much. And they don't understand what the nuance is. So, you know, there's a lot of parts, but if you can understand that physical path, if you can understand what the path report and predictions put out and you understand what everything in that bomb is, then you're going to be in a way better state than just kind of blindly leading, you know, and even we say it with our stuff too. Yeah, that's really, those are really good points, Caleb, because I I think it was just yesterday I was doing that for somebody where I outlined the bill of materials and I, I did a little, um, uh, photoshopping, if you will, you know, to the, to the bomb to point at each item and say, this is what, you know, this is what this is. And, 
And, you know, maybe you're going to choose between choice A and choice B, you know, surge protection. Is it going to be outdoor mounted or indoor mounted? You know, do you need one? Do you need two? Um, if you buy this one, well, you're going to ground it this way. But if you're going to buy this one, it's going to be grounded differently. And those are, you know, those are important perspectives. Um, and I, yeah, you know, it's like you could you could come to work for me tomorrow, Caleb, if things are bad at RF Elements, because, you know, we've got... <laughs> Well, Ken, it was great having you on the show. Thank you so much for, for joining, and we'll see you messages. next time. <laughs> yeah, no, but what you said is so funny because I could literally pull up right now and show you these little um, templates uh, uh, that we drop into our quotes and our and our emails that we send to customers to say, you know, here's your radios, antennas, uh, capacity keying, if that applies or something like that. Yeah. But guess what? doesn't include sales tax doesn't include freight, doesn't include fibers, DC cables, SFPs, you know, all these things. And uh, it's not like I'm trying to mislead somebody because that's in bold print and it's right here and it's all, you know, pasted straight into your email every time I send a quote until you answer these questions. You know, I don't know how long your fibers need to be. I don't know how long your DC cables need to be. I don't, if I don't know where you live and I don't have an account for you, I can't tell you how much freight it's going to be. You know, uh, I don't know how much your sales tax rate is going to be. So, you know, we we have you, everything you said. Yeah, I mean, we could be talking about, a, you know, somebody says, well, how much does a link like that cost? And of course, I'm almost it depends, you know, uh, no, it's, it's, you know, radios and antennas. I can give you that number. I know exactly what that price is, but it's all this extra stuff. I don't know, you know, so I'm going to have to ask you a bunch of questions. Um, uh, you know, I can give somebody a range to say, you know, most customers end up spending about this amount of money. Um, but, you know, until you get into the specifics of what you exactly need, you know, we don't we don't really know what it's going to cost. Uh, but that's been the beauty we're working on. Um, like we have a so we do we deal direct with our customers. I think we're the only backhaul company that does. And we have an online store, which is not all that fancy. It's really more of a place to just check off things you want to buy. And that's part of the reason I've got some help on my side because we basically do that for our customers and set up a shopping cart for them and say, okay, this is everything you're going to need after we've asked them a bunch of questions. Um, but we're moving towards trying to um, get those tools to help guide you, right? And say, okay, you've made, it, you've made one decision. Now let's talk about your fibers, you know? How many of them, you know, this is why you'd want at least one. This is why you might consider having two how do we figure out how long they need to be? How about SFPs? You need one at the top and the bottom. The top one needs to be industrial temperature, temperature rated. All those things you just said. And, and trying to move more to a DIY experience because it's great for us. It's great for our customers. They can just go do whatever they need to do. They don't need a lot of help. Good for us because I don't have to hire extra people and make my gear more expensive because I'm spending money on people. And try to drive that to where all those decisions can be made and you understand what it is you're you're putting together if you're putting together a building materials. Yeah, that, that bomb is just so important. And don't y'all don't estimate what oh I I need a you know 150 feet of fiber. Yeah, that's plenty. The tower is a hundred feet. So you know you don't need any loop or any uh, uh bins or radius and then you you get your fiber and it's 10 foot too short and you're like you realize this shit doesn't stretch, right? So I think it's that yeah. um understanding how big a six foot dish really is, or God forbid an eight, <laughs> you know, and they're like, hey man, uh yeah, uh I don't I don't think this is gonna fit on my tower. I'm like, what kind of tower? You got? No, 120. <laughs> Dude, I've seen it. 125 know, feet. Yeah. It looks like a dandelion. It's like this, and it's just going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, how tall is this? 125. Yeah, I'm going 150 feet that way. So yeah, yeah it's. Yeah. We've seen some yeah, sketchy no, stuff. You know, and dish size. Actually, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the the topic of dish size. Because number one, yeah, if you've never stood next to a six foot dish, you have no no idea how big they are. I mean, most of us are you know, probably in the vicinity of six feet tall. You stand next to a six foot dish and they're huge. Yeah, they're not built. They're not built like a little simple, like, oh, a two foot mm -hmm. dish is this and a six foot is this, but bigger. Yeah. I'm like, no, it gets it yeah. gets a little heavier. Or your dish cost is now, you know, it's not a direct uh direct cost correlation. It's now four times, six times expensive. And wow, freight too. Um yeah, right. you know, I like, cost a, more a than the radio. Dish, mm -hmm. Yeah, six foot dishes. Two times the price of a four foot dish. 
a yep. four foot dish is just a little bit more money than three foot dish. So yep. it, it's, yeah, it gets, and then you're paying for getting on a truck and driving it to, you know, from our Texas warehouse to wherever you happen to be, that's going to be a ton of money and you can't fit it in the back of your truck. So that's the other problem. You, know? oh, it's like, you can, uh, you just gotta be a little <laughs> clever. So <laughs> There's there's been some where I'm like, well, all right, we're not gonna pass any DOT. Let's just get this done. So in the dark of night, we're yeah, gonna it's banjo right. time, boys. So <laughs> yeah, but you know, antenna size is another topic because that's another thing I've been trying to educate. Um, when the low cost licensed radios came out, one of the popular things to do is say, well, you know, we're we're going to license. Okay, we're gonna spend more money than we've ever spent on a backhaul. Um, and lo and behold, you're running, you know, these, uh, two foot dishes or two and a half foot dishes on 11 gigahertz, which is fine. That'll get you some distance and get you some capacity, but guess what? That falls into something called category B. Yep. And if nobody's ever done any lessons on category B, I've got a nice video on that, but, uh, I was a little club there, but the idea is, um, category B, I actually had this happen at my local ISP of all, of all companies. They had a six gig link they had to put up from one, one point to another. Um, they had a zoning restriction at the building on one end of that link, and they had to put a three foot dish on it. Uh, three foot dish, by the way, minimum size for six gigahertz. Six foot dish is minimum category A size for six gigahertz. So they were operating in category B on that end of the link. They had that link running for less than a year, and they got a letter from the coordinator of the FCC that said they had to either get off those frequencies or increase the the dish to six foot. Um, and um, they ended up, we got lucky, we found another channel pair for them. So they got to move to a different channel pair. That cost them money, they had to go through re-coordination. They had to buy new radios because the radios that they had didn't operate in the channel pair that it came in. The high and the low? Uh, yeah, yeah. So they had to buy a whole new pair of radios um, and pay for FCC coordination all over again, only to be exposed in the same way that they were exposed in step one mm. you know it still could get another letter from the fcc a year from now five years from now and say guess what you got to do it again um now they're they did it for a reason they kind of had no other choice this is the only way they could build this link um but for these customers that are using two to two and a half foot category b dishes on 11 gigahertz lengths you could have used a three foot dish and gotten yourself in the category a and never had to worry about it and that's something that nine out of 10 of my customers have never heard before. Mm. They don't even know. And so they've got 25 links in their network of AF11 or B11 or something like that with less than three foot dishes on them. Every one of those links is an opportunity for the FCC to come to them one day and say, guess what? You're going to have to turn that thing off, change channels or upgrade your dishes. And those could be, that could be a painful day. Um, and I think, my prediction is <laughs> um, I've seen five times as many cases of that in the last three years. And I saw in the first 35 years of my career, I'm going to see 10 times more cases in the next year and probably 20 times more cases the year after that. Yeah. Because the congestion is real. Um, and um, so, you know, one of the pieces of advice I'm giving people who are starting off with the lower end gear is, hey, at least try to get yourself into a category A dish. Or even for my gear, I got people who run them at two two foot, and they say, "Hey, that looks good." And I say, "Yeah, it does look good." But hey, if you can afford a three foot dish, let's get you into that because it'll it'll keep you from ever having to come back and and relicensing it. And it's not always practical, you know. I mean, I get that, you know. You say, "Hey, well, we just can't do that," you know. This tower is not sturdy enough, or whatever reason it might be. Mm -hmm. um, that's what. But you got you should know, you know. That's the point, right? At least understand you had a choice to make. You might have had some conditions that force you to make a choice one one way or the other. But at least you're now knowledgeable about the fact that this is that these are the ramifications of the choice that you've made. Um, and I don't think anybody. I don't know. Maybe other people are talking about those kinds of things to their customers. But I feel like I might be the only one talking to customers about that aspect of their licensed radios. And and it's not about me selling a three foot dish or a two foot dish. I don't care. I want you to. You know, I want you to not be surprised <laughs> next year when somebody comes knocking on your door and saying, guess what, you know, all that money you spent? Yeah, well, you know, 
too bad. Yeah. I, I think that, that footnotes on a lot of coordination sheets you get. And I think a lot of people are like, me, okay, cool. Like it's, yeah. it's never happened Not gonna to be me. me. You know, I've never had to deal <laughs> with it. There's nobody like out that. here. Yeah. There's nobody <laughs> out here. Yeah. Run into that. <laughs> I run into that dude with six you know, gigs. We have, you know, that's another area where like we have an online tool that does your path planning or, you know, you can do your path planning, but we have a, um, a feature in there where you can basically say, show me all the 11 gigahertz lengths within 20 miles of this pin and boom, they all light up. And some people get freaked out because they see like 300 lengths in the neighborhood and they go, oh man, this is crazy. I'm never going to get an 11 gigahertz channel. That's not the point. You know, the point is to understand once you understand the geometry of links, you can start to say, well, you look at it carefully and go, okay, this is not going to look too bad because I got nobody coming into my face. I got nobody coming into the backside of my antenna. My, you know, my path is, is linearly pretty well aligned because most of your interference is going to come from the front or come, come from the back. And um, if you can see that and then you start looking at channels, that's what the SCC coordinators are all about. I mean, you don't have to do any of that work, but in about, you know, 10 seconds to 15 seconds, you can get um, an, an instant idea of how difficult something's going to be. And it's not a bad idea. Why not spend an extra 15 seconds to say, hey, what does my environment look like? Yeah. The other really good thing about that is you can light that up and say, hey, who's got links in my area? Where are the towers? You know, I mean, because all these, all these links are usually on towers or rooftops. You can sort of figure out where people are building relays and that might help you find, you know, partners or towers or other, other things to work with. Yeah. Visual tool like that is so handy. Cause you know, you're going to get 10,000 PCN notices and no one ever reads those. Right. Or, <laughs> or that you're supposed to, or like glance at them and be like, whatever. So, um, there's a couple of visual tools out there now. You guys, um, Mimosa has got a real good one. Um, yeah. and there's some others out there that are good, good for visualization. So, and I think, you know, we talk about six gig a lot cause that's in, in our space, that's what the big, one of the big next things This you know, it's always some big thing mm -hmm. coming up, but, but, you know, six gig is, is really for the multi-point perspective, folks are really excited, but you know, there is a consideration. There are a lot of existing six gig links out there and how's that really going to affect the, uh, the, uh, AFS, and stuff. So, I mean, do you have any sort of insight on that side of things? Like, <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's another great question, Caleb. I'm glad you brought it up. It's, it's tricky. So let's start with some fundamentals. Um, before anybody in the WISP world ever really heard about, you know, six gig in the way that we're talking about it today, they may or may not have ever heard about six gig licensed. And there's a six gig license band. If I get it right, I think it's something like roughly 5.9 something to 6.4 something. Um, and um, this has been a very, very popular frequency band for licensed microwave operators. Um, and number one, because six gig propagates very, very well. So you can get a long yep. distance. Um, the other, another thing that happened is way back in the late 90s, there was a band around uh, 1.9 to 2.1 gig that the operators used to also operate in. And they got kicked out of the band so that something called PCS or what we now call cellular, you know, could use those, those frequency bands. So almost everybody that had a two gigahertz radio um, had to get moved. And most of them moved to six gig because it was the only band that could really do the distance. So six gig got really congested. Um, and it's hard to get six gig licenses in most places, frankly, these days. Uh, another downside to six gig is that it has a uh, narrower channel, 60 megahertz wide maximum channel compared to 11 or 18 that have 80 megahertz channels. So again, you get less capacity in that band. Um, but there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of six gig licensed radios up and running. And most of them are being used for public safety, um, uh, critical infrastructure for municipalities like electrical, oil, gas, um, and cellular service. You know, that's probably the lion's share of those three categories, probably the lion's share of almost all the six gig license radios. I've sold a bunch of six gig radios to WISP too. So, you know, that that's that's out there and available to you. What the SEC is trying to do is figuring out how to frequency share. And most of the bands that everybody operates is some sort of sharing. Hmm. Um, if people have all heard about DFS channels of 5.4 gigahertz, that exists because you're sharing that spectrum with some satellite uplink technology that operates in that band. And you're trying to make sure that you don't cause interference into those, those systems, which are much more critical. 
Um, and that's the same idea here in six gigahertz. The, the thing about six gigahertz is going to be, I'm excited about six gigahertz on one hand and say, hey, this is great. A whole bunch of new spectrum for the WISP. They can deliver a whole bunch of capacity, sort of a greenfield like a new five, right? You know, <laughs> sort of like that, right? You get some wideband, clear spectrum, go out and run some networks and hook up a bunch of people. Um, the, the risky part of this is that um, we don't know yet, and I think it'll take us some time to figure out, um, whether or not the six gig unlicensed stuff might end up actually interfering with the six gig licensed stuff. And the FCC works hard on trying to get the regulations right for power and where you can put things. And they're going to have these reporting things a lot like CBRS to try to figure out, you know, can you use this channel at this location with this power, with this antenna? And will it not interfere with an existing six gig licensed radio? Um, so a lot of science is being applied to try to make sure that interference never happens. Um, uh, and, and it won't be perfect. So, you know, there'll probably be some cases where that, that doesn't work out. Um, I think the long, the long goal of it, though, is that I look at it as like there's no way back, right? It's not like they're going to release 6 gig and say, okay, go for it, make this all happen. And, oh, oh we've got interference in the 6 gig <laughs> license radio. Guess what? We're going to kick all the 6 gig license radios out. It, it, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, what's more likely to happen is that they'll have to make some adjustments to the usage of the 6 gig unlicensed somehow you know, maybe lower powers, or they're going to change the way that they calculate interference for, you know, to determine whether or not you can use that channel at that location with that antenna pointed in that direction, you know, sort of refine the science so that um, where you continue to reduce the possibility that interference is going to happen in the, the, the license links. So I'm a, I, I'm a pragmatist there, you know, I'm looking at it and saying, it'll, it'll work out. It kind of has to, mm. right? Because as soon as a bunch of six gig unlicensed gear gets out there, it's not like the FCC is going to be able to say, okay, you know, shut it all down. We made a mistake. <laughs> um, they don't want that, number one, and it probably wouldn't really work, you know. So um, there will have to be, much like DFS, we had problems with DFS. If anybody remembers like the, the Puerto Rico incident, <laughs> yeah. things that happened, I mean, this was very real where one vendor's gear was not receiving the, the interference information properly or the rules weren't quite tight tight enough that it actually was causing interference into something it shouldn't have been causing interference into you. It was nobody's fault. It was really just a matter of the fact that the, the, the laws or the regulations had to get more precise and some things had to change in order for it to make to work in a cooperative way. And so I think that we'll see that evolution you know, in the six gig band, you know, as it, as it starts to roll out and as problems maybe pop up here and there. Um, but in the meantime, I mean, I have no qualms with, you know, if somebody needs a six gig license link, yeah, let's go. You know, if that's the right band for you and the right band for your link, there's no stopping you from doing that. I don't think there's any concern about it whatsoever. And I'm, I'm much more excited about the six gig opportunity than scared by it. I'm actually not scared by it at all. Like I said, I think it'll just work out. It, it will have to work out. People will have to figure out how to how to adjust the expectations of the band to make it work. Yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see for sure, for sure. So, all right, all right. So now, time for everyone's favorite conversation: the last two years, uh, COVID, <laughs> supply chain end of the world. Um, I don't know, whatever's burning down this week. So, you know, it's definitely been challenging. I think we've talked about it a number of times on the podcast. Yeah. Our, you know, how it's affected us, how it's affected other manufacturers and stuff. So, you know, I don't think there's a lot of new ground here, but you guys, you know, you've got some advantages for some other, versus some other outfits out there, you know, from being based here in the U S which you've got going on in Texas. So if you can give us the, the elevator pitch of kind of what you guys have seen from all this, how you sort of pivoted and uh, you know, where it's gone. Yeah. Um, no uh, RF elements podcast would be complete without a discussion of the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. That, you know, that and Tasso is complaining about 4096 qualms. So you mentioned that earlier. And I'm like, sweet, I can go get a snack while I hear this rant for the 17th. Well, Stop my rant. Stop my rant. <laughs> snack time. But uh, we moved on from it. So for clarification, we're talking about 4096 qualms at the edge, not in the back hall, because it's pretty reliable in the back hall. Um, you know, the, uh, on the, 
On the COVID side of things, it's been interesting, obviously, you know, one time. Um, number one, I mean, from a demand standpoint for WISP and internet in general, I mean, you know, I don't want to make like the pandemic was wonderful, but, uh, you know, the pandemic was pretty good for business. Everybody had to start working from home. All the kids had to start learning from home. It's like, yeah, we need bandwidth. Um, I think it's helped accelerate uh, the WISP business overall, which has is, been really impactful. Um, supply chain has been a real challenge. Um, I think that we had the upper hand in a few areas, and we are a U.S.-based company, uh, headquarters and a factory in Texas. We also manufacture some stuff overseas, so I don't want to come off as being like everything is simple that way. Um, but just I think probably the key thing is being in control of our own technology. Um, you know, we we design and build our own radios. And so like one key thing that's happened along the way is um, there was a particular component in our POE circuit that just suddenly it's like we can't get this component anymore. And we had a few thousand of them or however many we had, but that's like we're not sure when we're ever going to see another one again. So we did a very quick pivot. We had literally every single radio we built, um, we built an entire mirror uh, product line. So we doubled our product line with all new part numbers, so new suffixes on the part numbers for radios that no longer supported PoE. Um, and we redesigned the circuit to basically kick the PoE out of it and some labels on the radios. And, and it's like, that sounds real simple, but it's not. It's like, you know, 250 new products. Um, but we did that quickly, like within a month. Um, because most of my customers don't use PoE. I've got an entire video on why not to use PoE. So heck, you know, it's like, um, you know, so most of my customers don't need that feature. That feature happens to be there. We can basically continue to supply to 95%, 98% of our customers, non-PoE radios, and they wouldn't know the difference. We just had to do this one thing. Um, that was huge. And, I, you know, it may sound easy, and it actually isn't that hard, um, but, you um, it, it made a huge difference. It meant we could just continue to ship radios. We just took one feature out that most people didn't need and boom, we're still shipping radios. Um, I think, uh, and there's three or four examples like that, um, you know, where we're basically redesigning circuits in the back in the background, having to qualify them. I mean, it's a lot of work to change a component, um, but um, being able to do that quickly and on the fly and not having to be just facing these product scarcities and just, no, we can't ship you any radios for now. Um, we never faced that. Uh, we we would have if we hadn't taken action. We had many, many terrible cases, but we were we had a great logistics team. Um, we had a lot of clout um, because we are the number one public safety um, solution. Um, we actually were able to get governmental support to put pressure on some suppliers to put us in the front of the lines. Um, so we were able to actually leverage some of that, which was nice. Um, and I think, you know, that all went overall pretty well. And we're still in really good shape. I mean, most of my customers are still shocked to say, hey, when can I get this? I said, well, you place your order, it's going to ship tomorrow. It was like, it's always the answer. And it has been pretty, pretty much continually. The only time we're out of something is if I haven't predicted something well. If I got, you know, I had a situation in March where, I had three different customers buy over a hundred of the same product in the same week. <laughs> um, that's a lot for a backhaul supplier. Hundred links from one customer, customer two, customer three, all in the same week, all the same product. I was out. I was out for like four weeks. But I think in other companies that would have sunk them. It'd be like three or four months till we can get you. And I, said, I was only out for four weeks because I didn't have that many in the factory at the time being built, but I had all the parts for it. I had parts for another 1,500 radios to build. All I had to do was just give the order to the factory, say, build, build more and build them fast because I'm out right now. And so customers didn't wait a long time, you know, for, for us being back into resupply. So that's been good. The harder thing has been, you know, we don't get, we don't get everything from ourselves, obviously, you know, and, you know, antennas actually, point to point antennas turned out to be the initial biggest problem for us. Um, our, one, our primary supplier was getting materials from India or, and some other place or whatever, where all the ports shut down and they didn't have any, and they didn't have enough in stock. And antenna supply just went like to zero. And so, but we were able to, the good thing is we're not all that antenna dependent. Mm. Um, we can go multiple places, but we had been relying on certain manufacturers and um, lead times got really bad. So, we learned the lesson, you know, probably everybody else did, which is you got to diversify. You have to have multiple 
vendors, you have to have multiple supply chains from multiple continents, from different directions. It's like, you're looking at all those aspects of you know having a more robust supply chain um, and also simply um, stocking more, you know, and and putting more risk in inventory, um, just to say, you know, we overbuy and overbuild as a result. And I think that's a little bit like the toilet paper crisis. You know, it's like unfortunately some of that has a bad effect because you, you you know you're not going to get any more for six months, so you buy three as much as you really need right now because you don't know when you're going to be able to get more later. Um, we had to do some of that as well, um, but. That's okay. That serves our customers well. You know, it didn't it didn't impact us significantly. We have had, you know, probably on the bigger picture is this back end stuff. The cost, you know, cost of freight is out of this world crazy. Um, cost of some certain materials is is has gone up significantly. Cost of labor has certainly gone up. Inflation is you know hitting everybody. Um, I think we've done well to manage that. We have not been impervious to it. And we've had increased prices here and there. Um, some obviously people don't like that, but it's true. And um, but uh, yeah, overall, I think we've been in. You know, I'm proud to say we've been in a really good position. Not because there's not like a thousand people running around, you know, playing whack a mole. Because that's exactly what it is. Like it's this part today, that part next week, and this one and that one. For the most part, I think we're past all that. It's now down to try to manage inflation probably more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely something everyone sees and everyone's got to deal with. So, um, let's see what else, uh, uh, new, new news nuggets. I'll mess that one up. Um, so <laughs> press release you guys just put out, uh, looks like you're buying red line or, or yeah, that's, I mean, that's, uh, so, um, I'll preface by saying the deal is not done. So anybody who's ever done an acquisition knows that there's like this thing they'd call a quiet period in there, you know? Yeah. So any lawyers um, watching, just, just be cool, be cool. So yeah, we'll just delay this episode. <laughs> no. uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's an interesting deal, you know, just, uh, looking at what's going on. I think, you know, I come from kind of like the wish side of the business. So when I saw the announcement, I'm kind of like, you know, okay, that's, seem a little unusual, um, mostly because they're just really not very prevalent. They used to be, you know, they were yeah. kind of like the Kings of Wine Max way back when, and, you know, they were yeah, some really interesting things. Um, what, what's happened there is that they've, they've made a pretty successful pivot in what, what I might call industrial LTE. Mm. I think that's probably like the right words to put around it. And, they also are doing more business um, outside of the United States uh, than they are inside the United States. Um, and uh, we're a multinational company, but you know, if you look at the mix of uh, domestic uh, North America versus non-North America business, and theirs are actually a little stronger uh, percentage-wise in the international market than we are. Um, so it, it would appear there's a pretty interesting play there for oil and gas and um, uh, the maybe mine, the mining industries and things of that nature. And that seems to be the, the primary emphasis of where they have a, a, a decent leadership position and an opportunity in those markets. And that plays well, you know, we are obviously pretty uh, involved in oil and gas uh, backhaul projects and things like that and more industrial safety, safety markets. So this idea of, um, you know, ruggedized, hardened uh, hardware, uh, for that application has has its place. Um, I've been dreaming about, you know, what does that mean for the Wisps? I mean, the first thing was, you know, everybody says, you know, make TV white space great again or whatever. Oh, jeez. You know? <laughs> All right, let me get my soapbox out again. 4096 Quan, let's talk about TV white space. Yeah, I don't think we really hit yeah. that one too much, but. <laughs> no, no, we won't, we won't. Yeah, you know, I, um, I frankly don't know. I mean, I, I'm interested in, I've never really dealt with it much, um, but I, I guess my outside looking in influence has been, you know, that that spectrum just never could realize what we thought it might have been able to realize at one point yeah. in time. I don't think that's really gear dependent. I haven't seen anything that says, oh, yeah, this spectrum is valuable. And that being said, there could be some, you know, there could be some pretty unique applications where that spectrum is valuable, but I frankly don't even know you know, what Redline's doing in that space anymore, if they're doing anything at all. 
Um, but, you know, uh, the interesting thing about that company is, you know, they've been around for a long time. Yeah. They've hung in there, you know, and that's, that's, there's something to be said. I've worked for a handful of brands. Who do we name already? You know, Mr. Multiplex, Exalt, Proxim, you know, that, you know, they're not, they're not what they used to be. Um, yeah, but uh, these folks have done pretty well to hang around in the industry and find a place where they can su succeed. Yeah, I've sold it. I sold a ton of A and ADIs back in the day. Yeah, you know, those are the thing, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, we talk about those legacy points, you know, there were products we talk about Breezecom and, you know, the Western Mall stuff mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the Orinoco uh, things. And, you know, it's like, and these were really important, you know, products to launch this industry. And I think Redline has a place in that history, in that history lesson. Um, so we'll see what happens. I think I I think uh, probably the underwhelming answer for the audience that might listen to this uh, is you know it 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 isn't a wisp play. You know it, it, if there's something there that would be a futures thing, maybe there's some engineers there that have you know great ideas about technology, and maybe they haven't had the funding or the backing that they that they need to you know really develop. That that'd be really super cool, but. Um, you know, it's this private LTE for industrial applications. That's the cornerstone of, of what drove that deal. So, you know, and this is all speculation. I mean, if it happens, right. You know, I, the Canadian government has to approve it, but, you know, the board of directors have jointly approved it. So it would seem that in the next, uh, I think they're saying two to three months, it would be an official thing. Gotcha. Yeah, I think the the Wiss talk hot take on that was pretty entertaining. I'm like, guys, it's all in this press release here, and the number, like, calm down. So, and sometimes <laughs> it is asking a lot to read past the headline and, and to read the rest of the article because I mean, I know it's tough. It was it was like 15 lines long, so it's pretty pretty deep. But um, <laughs> anyway, it's a lot of reading for some of yeah, us. <laughs> exactly. So. And I guess, I mean, we could probably sit here and talk for a really long time, but I guess we should probably think about uh, tail ending this a little bit. So we talked earlier about, you know, what should, should new lists that are learning what license links are, what should they consider understanding your path calcs and your, your bombs and stuff like that? Um, I don't know. I thought it'd be kind of fun to kind of to end this talking about what, uh, what, what they should not do. Like, I don't know, dumb tales from the field or something. Um, it's always kind of a fun time. Like my dandelion example is what I was thinking of when I was jotting down my notes, you know, giant dishes on small towers, like bad news or, uh, Oh geez. Uh, you'll get out there to a site and there's, there's not a single part of this tower or the mount that's plum right it's all just cocked over a few degrees and then you're starting a path and instead of pathing you're pathing like this it's something i'm very preachy about because i've burnt i've been burned too many times i'm from a link <laughs> from a link that won't dial in right and then it's because you're moving it like hey, this. if you put the right side if you put the right side dish to the right height you can straighten that tower out <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's how slant pole was invented yeah you know? exactly it was leaning <laughs> like this so <laughs> but um i don't know any any fun sort of like just goofy stuff you see uh not sizing out your tower legs like i see that happen all the time uh just just so many of these little things cable yeah links. you know i i i can tell a lot of fun stories that are just plain weird but i think you know to be helpful to people probably one of the things that was really interesting to me some folks on the wisp talk forum know a guy by the name of tyler casey um, uh, DM internet up in Northern California. And, um, we did an 80 gigahertz link with him and, and it wasn't holding up as well as we might've thought. And part of it was structural, you know, and talk a little bit about, you know, just the, the structures weren't all that firm, not his fault necessarily. Um, but it turns out he lives in like the windiest County in our entire state. And, um, he was getting more wind outage than he was getting rain outage. And we're usually all hyped up about rain outage at 80 gigahertz. And that's all we can really look at. Um, we did an experiment with him where we dropped from his two foot dishes, which gave him the performance we were expecting. We dropped his dishes down to one footers. Um, and his uh, link has been significantly better. Yep. <laughs> um, wider beam it, angle. So, yeah, you know, just a wider beam width. Um, a smaller dishes, yeah, you know, he might get a little bit more rain outage, but he has more wind than he has rain. Hmm. So um, we made a, you know, we made a pivot and an adjustment there. Um, 
And I think that lesson uh, was sort of early on in some of my practical event application here at Aviad anyway. And uh, from that point on, I'm, you know, talking to more customers about, you know, the firmness of your, of your tower mounts and, and, um, you know, where are these things going to go? And, you know, should we consider looking at smaller dishes in some cases than bigger dishes? Because bigger dishes are always better in backhaul. Not, no, no, the answer is not true. I mean, I've, I've always said that probably for 40 years in my career until recently. I said, no, bigger dishes aren't always better for performance. Um, we have this wind factor, especially with these super narrow beams. And we're talking about quarter degree beam widths on these engineers. You know, 60 gigahertz is a training ground for eBay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I've done 60 gigahertz. I said, yeah, okay, number one, the bandwidths are wider. Number two, the paths are shorter. So guess what? This is going to be even harder. Um, that's probably the most practical story. It's not as fun as, you know, a lot of stories about like the guy who tried to wall mount his radio and ran a screwdriver, you know, ran a drill through the top of the radio and mounted it to the wall and then sent it back because after he wall mounted, it didn't work. That's fun. Not very practical. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that I have a lot of fun with is um, just trying to figure things out that aren't working. Try to, you know, it's like, why, why is this not working the way that we think it would? Um, got another local customer who's getting some interference into one of his 11 gigahertz licensed links. And um, it's odd to see it. And we're trying to hunt it down, you know? So I enjoy, I enjoy that aspect of the business because I always learned something, you know, you had cases where like we had this nice round glass building to the right hand side of the link or something. It was giving us these awkward reflections in the back of our dishes You know, nothing we could have ever predicted necessarily. And so I, the, the world of RF to me is a little bit like a um, plumbing apprentice or whatever you want to look at it. You're always learning, you know, always going to see something that you've never seen before. <laughs> and you take some of that knowledge and you learn from it and you kind of build on it and your eyes get a little wider and your perspective gets a little bit better on, on what can go wrong. Um, so while I don't enjoy troubleshooting radio so much, um, I do enjoy the adventure of um, learning why something didn't work that uh, that we would think should be working fine. Um, so there's plenty of that. I'm sure there's plenty of that ahead, you know, and frankly, as we get into, we talked earlier about, you know, everything's got to get higher frequency, everything's got to get shorter. We're just going to see more of that. And hopefully we get some technology um, that helps us with that. Things like maybe beam steering antennas or you know, there's mechanical things that can be done with the antennas to try to keep them aligned. Um, there's electromechanical things that can that can be done there too. So, I, I think that technology will, you know, continue to evolve to address the shortcomings of or the challenges of using these kinds of things as we get there. We have to make them practical. So ultimately, yep. you know, I can bolt them to a tower and you know aim them in the general direction and just sort of walk away. That'd be great. That's never really been the case for backhaul so far, but I think, you know, as we see time evolve, that's, that's going to get, that has to get better and better. Cool. Cool. Well, I think it's time to wrap this one up. Ken, for those, uh, looking for you, uh, in a good way, not a bad way. It sounds a little ominous, but, uh, for people who would <laughs> like to have a pleasant conversation with you, uh, what's the best way to track you down? Where can they find you? That's great. Um, probably the easiest way um, is through Facebook, Facebook Messenger, Wisp Doc. Um, you'll see me very active there. Um, uh, my uh, email address at Aviat is ken, K E N dot Rupel, R U P P E L, at Aviatnet. That's just there to confuse you. A V I A T N E T dot com. So it's like Aviatnetworks.com. That's Aviatnet.com. Um, yeah, so I th I'd say through, you know, through Facebook's probably the easy way to do it. That email address I just gave you is a, another great way to get to me. And just about, you know, I, somebody knows me who you know. So just say, yeah, how do I get a hold of that guy? Um, I, I have the curse of living on the West Coast. So I'm usually not awake when most of everybody else is awake. So I try to keep people from waking me up if I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Try to keep that in mind a little bit when you're reaching out to me is uh, phone calls at uh, 4 a.m. or usually not answered um you know unless i happen to be awake but that's uh, i do my best to give back to you now I, I enjoy being part of the community and um you know the just the opportunity to we talked about it at the front end just you know to kind of 
be a part of this, this movement, you know, that's been going on now for 20 years, uh, more than 20 years, 25 years, I think, since I put my first Ethernet radio up, um, you know, just having an impact on our communities and just working with the WISP has just been so rewarding. So I'm looking forward to, you know, um, helping, helping folks learn more about it and uh, being successful in their business and helping their communities get connected. So. Cool, cool, man. Well, I would, we definitely appreciate you talking to us here, uh, sharing your experiences, and uh, this has been great. So, Tassos, where can people find us? Yes, they can find us everywhere on social media. Definitely Facebook is uh, one of the best places, and a lot of the WISP groups like WISP Talk, WISP Picks, uh, WISP Starter, you name it, not WISP, <laughs> you'll find us there. Uh, Instagram is another good place. Of course, email uh, tassos at rfelements.com or even you, Caleb, at rfelements.com. And then you know our website, rfelements.com, a great place for finding uh, all the information uh, that you need and, uh, you know, reaching out to us via email or phone or what have you. All right, all right, all right. Well, until next time, everybody, uh, we will talk to y'all later. So be good. Be good, everybody. Bye. See ya.